Welcome to another episode of the AMSC podcast. In this episode, I'm with John Kotzman, another instructor from the intermediate course, and we discuss the elements of critical thinking and what doctrine has to say about it. All right, welcome, uh, John. Today I've got John Kotzman with me. He is an instructor at the intermediate course. Good morning, John. Hey, good morning, James. Thanks for having me. Uh, appreciate the invite. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Our topic today is critical thinking, and I got to tell you, easily one of my most favorite topics that we teach here at the Army Management Staff College is critical thinking. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. This will be a good discussion. Okay. Yeah, it's also one of my favorite topics as well. And we're probably only going to be able to scratch the surface today and look at one slice of it. We could probably produce a, a year or two's worth of podcasts just on critical thinking alone. We could do a whole episode, maybe multiple episodes on logical fallacies or even getting into the root of things into maybe even philosophy. But today I think we're going to keep it focused on the theme of our first batch of podcasts has been centered more around the self-awareness. So I think we'll be talking a lot about egocentrism today. Are you good with that, John? Oh, absolutely. And gosh, you're so right. We could go on for ages. This is such a fantastic topic and uh, you're absolutely right. That's a good place to start and kind of focus our energy for, for this podcast. Great. But I have a, a mental model or schema, and something I've only um, recently developed. I, I used to think that it, I was a critical thinker. I think that's kind of the default, that nobody wants to walk around thinking that they're not a critical thinker. And if asked, of course, I'm a critical thinker. And now that I've been exposed to so much more, and now that I have to, I have to teach it on a regular basis, I'm not so quick to answer that question now. I have to answer it with less confidence that, you know what, I'm constantly working on it and developing it. And so the mental model I've developed over time is that, it, it challenge me if I'm wrong, but if the, the more confident someone is in responding, yes, of course, I'm a critical thinker, the less likely they are to truly be one. I, am I wrong? Challenge me if I'm wrong. Well, I'll tell you, I think it's like many of us, you know, we start out, you're unconsciously incompetent about something, and then you figure out, hey, here's some new information. And then what's the next step? You figure out, hey... I am now consciously incompetent on a subject. It's like the first time you pick up that uh, miniature guide to critical thinking and concepts and tools by Dr. Paul and Dr. Elder. Page 20 talks about the stages of critical thinking development. At the very bottom, you have the unreflective thinker who's just unaware, you know, and how significant it is to think critically. And then the next stage is the challenged thinker, and then... We move up to the beginning thinker who's trying to find ways to improve how he thinks. Then you have the practice thinker, the advanced thinker, and the accomplished thinker. I agree. I think a lot of people, is once they start to delve into the subject, they see their own shortcomings pretty fast. As I try to practice critical thinking, I look at that model in the critical thinking guide, and I'd say I'm probably a practicing thinker. You know, I'm really striving to be an advanced thinker and even an accomplished thinker. But by the standards of what we learn and know about critical thinking, I'd have to be more, you know, a little intellectual humility here. But I'd say I'm a practice thinker because I'm sure trying and I'm sure carrying around this little guide with me and applying it with wherever I can, whether it's just a general conversation on anything or, I don't know, the plethora of briefs we give, the decision briefs we give, the papers that we grade, the things that we look at. I mean... There's just no limit. You know, I see that in my students, too. I think, from my perspective, my students, as they learn and practice critical thinking, they see a tool for improving the quality of their lives. I mean, everybody wishes to communicate and reason clearly. Communicate and reason accurately, precisely, accurately. That's what we're all looking to do. You know, when you grasp some of these ideas, I, I, I can see that. All right, let's talk about that book that you referenced just for a moment. Sure. So those who have been to Fort Leavenworth and have attended CGSC or any of uh -huh. the CES courses, basic, intermediate, or advanced, we'll, you'll get this little book, uh, the Critical Thinking book. And right. it's produced by uh, Paul and Elder. And actually, they've got a website. If you are listening and would like to see some of the models to which we're referring, and their website is uh, www.criticalthinking.org. You can actually order the little pamphlet there if you haven't attended one of the courses. But also a lot of the models they have in there are also in ATP, the 2-33.4. 
And so with, I think that one might be FOUO, so it would require CAC access to, to get that one, but that also has the same models right from Paul and Elder. They absolutely do. And for me, I think what's brilliant about this is now what we see from Dr. Paul and Dr. Elder is actually part of our Army doctor now in that ATP. I mean, the intelligence community is using that to flesh out the things that they do. But you're right. You know, I've seen this miniature guide to critical thinking at a couple of places here at the Army University of all of our colleges. I mean, the Command General Staff College, the School of Command Prep, in our, our own school, the Army Management Staff College, the School of Advanced Tactics, School of Advanced Military Studies. There's a lot of places that use this. And I remember my first time of seeing this book was Cast Cube. Back when we had Cast Cube in 2002, back then they were blue. We just called them the little blue book. I mean, we used them for everything, to self-critique assignments, our briefs, decision papers, decision matrices, I mean, everything. And I still use it today for those same purposes here at work. Now, let's, let's go ahead and define critical thinking. I think doctrine has a definition for it already. And we'll take a little deeper dive into what it is and what that means. Sure. Um, well, just you know, looking at the Army Doctrinal Reference Publication 6-22 in Chapter 5 tells us critical thinking is a thought process that aims to find facts, to think through issues, and solve problems. You know, critical thinking examines a problem in depth with multiple points of view. And that's not too far off the mark of how Paul and Elder offer a definition of critical thinking. They say, Critical thinking is the art of analyzing and evaluating thinking with a view to improve thinking. So, so two definitions there. So the first line of ADRP 622, the definition is a the critical thinking is a thought process that aims to find facts. And that seems so simple. Facts are verifiable. They're, certainly we'd have to agree. There are things that get in the way of that. We've got filters. We've Absolutely. got biases, mental models, schemas. I have mine. And Paul and Elder talk about one of the biggest inhibitors of critical thinking is this concept known as egocentric thinking. Have you heard of that before, John? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting uh, from the guide. You know, egocentric, is, uh, e egocentric thinking results from the unfortunate fact that humans don't naturally consider the rights and needs of others. You know, we don't naturally appreciate the point of view of others nor the limitations to our own point of view. I mean, we become explicitly aware of our egocentric thinking only if trained to do so. And we do not naturally recognize our egocentric assumptions as we think through things. Right. Well, I, what I've read in studies, cognitive psychology studies, it seems to be the default position, especially when we're young, we're children, we start off in an egocentric state and it's possibly part of our survival. But as we develop in complex societies and a complex world, it's very important now to be able to distinguish ourselves from others, and more specifically, to have the ability to untangle our subjective biases from objective reality. And that, that's really what the challenge is, it's the crux of it right there, and how Paul and Elder were stating in their definition, how are we evaluating our own thinking with the goal of improving our thinking so we can try to look past our, our subjectivity to arrive at more objective yeah, reality? I, I, absolutely. There's nothing vicious or maniacal about a human being in his state of, look, I'm trying to make sense of things. I want to, as fast as I can, make sense of my world. So what do I want to do? I want to categorize stuff. What's true? What's false? What's right? What's wrong? What's logical? What's illogical? You know, I want to make those distinctions. And I'm doing it really quick because of my highly evolved brain. Well, that's great for survival, but guess what? Now I'm overly relying on egocentric thinking and sociocentric thinking. Mm -hmm. And I probably could gain a lot of benefit from learning how to cultivate and make sure egocentricism and sociocentricism does not get in the way of my thinking, of my actions, of how I see things. Egocentric thinking is easy to spot in a child. Usually it's why they don't want to share or me first. Now, when we start seeing adults, how it typically looks to me, something, you know, what I see, my perspective from my foxhole is somehow special, where of all the billions of people that have ever existed on this planet, the time and place where I am right now is special. The frame of reference that I have is what matters most. My country, my religion, <laughs> my politics, that, that is what's most important. And I, I don't care about, about yours or your perspective. That's more of what it looks like 
in, in the adult stage. And sure. For those who haven't become aware of their egocentric thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to get past that, you have to be comfortable with recognizing uh, your own flaws in thinking. And for some people, it's, it's very challenging to be presented with, with that, hey, listen, your, your, your logic is flawed or you just committed a logical fallacy or you're not... It's a non sequitur. What you're saying doesn't follow. John, do you have any techniques for helping people get past that and to be more comfortable with being challenged? Because it can be really uncomfortable for a lot of people, I think, to to challenge their own thinking. That, because it's so comfortable. We we build these mental models, these schemas of, of how the world works, how things operate. And to have that challenge can be terribly uncomfortable for, for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when one engages in critical thinking and some reflective thinking, you know, it's easy to spot. Why do I believe this? Well, it's true because I want to believe it, or it's true because we believe it, or it's true because I want to believe it, or it's true because I have always believed it. Think of all the obvious flaws in what I just said. There's ways to overcome that. You just got to slow down your thinking, and you have to think about your thinking while you're thinking with the goal to improve your thinking. Okay. So yeah, the world is flat. And well, it's true because I believe it or because those around me say the world is flat. Most of us, if you look around, believe that the world is flat. Therefore, it is that type of thinking. Actually, there's now a resurgence, though, in, in flat earthers. I, that's another topic for another, <laughs> another podcast. Well, how about the common belief that at one time everyone believed that a human being could not run a four minute mile? Yes. And then one day someone ran a four minute mile. And then as soon as that happened? In the same year, three people ran a four-minute mile. Yes. So you make your own mental model, and you're stuck. And you can't imagine getting outside of what you believe to be true because it's conventional wisdom. I've looked at the world. I know what's true. I know what's false. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. Well, that just challenges all your assumptions. Mm -hmm. My gosh, I need to overcome my egocentric thinking. One of the models that we use in all of the courses here and all of the resident courses is the ladder of inference. And I yeah. believe that first originated in Peter Senge's books on organizational learning, the fifth discipline. Absolutely. Now, the, the uh, let's talk about that. Do you mind talking about the uh, ladder of inference for just a moment? Oh, I think it's quite appropriate. So as we go about in life, we're constantly being exposed to data. And data is it's unprocessed information, but our brains are very quick to process the data that we see and where there's gaps in that our brain is very quick to pave over the potholes to fill in the information and it's a very actually amazing wonderful thing it's what affords us the opportunity to to drive to work without remembering it or to <laughs> to, to make assumptions uh well i have to make safe assumptions throughout my day i can't i, can, I work on the third floor if i couldn't make the assumption that the floor was going to support me and I had to analyze every step that I took, I would never be able to survive or accomplish anything. I wouldn't be productive. So there are certain, though, assumptions or certain meanings that we make from our data that now have implications and it's to be aware of those. And to give an example, for instance, let's say that we're in a meeting, John, and I observe that you're on your phone and you're not contributing to the meeting. That's the data. So it's going to go right through my filters on what conclusions I'm going to start making. I'm going to start making meaning of that, first of all. John doesn't seem to care. He's in disengaged. He's disengaged. I'm going to make assumptions. I'm going to say, well, if John doesn't care, then maybe he shouldn't even be in our meeting or be on this project. Yeah, and exactly. Then, then it goes through my beliefs, what I believe about the world. And then at the top of the ladder, we've got the actions that I'll take. So perhaps that action I take is I asked you, look, I don't want you to be on my team anymore. I choose to dislike you because obviously you didn't value what I had to say. But, sure. but what else could have been going on? In, the, in that meeting when you picked up your phone and, and weren't sharing. Yeah, I could have been looking at precise information to help uh, advance our agenda. I could have been looking at the things that I, you know, placed on my SharePoint so that I can refer them for this meeting. I could have been looking at my notes. But as you say, it sounds like from your perspective, you ran right to the top of your ladder of inference and decided I wasn't an active participant, which... I've, I've been guilty of that myself. That's, that's a legitimate mistake. Right. Well, and that second to the top rung is our beliefs. Uh, you know, I adopt beliefs about the world. And there's a feedback loop from that that goes all the way back to the bottom of those filters that that data has to percolate through. And so our beliefs right. shape our filters and how we see information, the, the right. lenses for which you look at the world. And that's where coming back now to looking at our subjectivity 
and being able to see objective reality, objective facts. It, it's all through our filters. None of us really have perfect 2020 vision. I think even ancient philosophers have argued over whether anything is truly objective, but there is a way to improve. You know, I'd say you know, 99% certainty what objective facts are. Sure, and I'm not even concerned so much about, I want to be as clear and as accurate, as precise as I am. I don't want to fool myself. I don't want to fool others. If I put out information that doesn't resonate or does is not logical, I'm going to lose some credibility within myself, with my peers, with everyone around me. So this is really important stuff. The thing I like about the ladder of inferences at the end of the day, it just tells us how we take actions, how we take actions, how we make decisions based on our beliefs. I mean, that's the ladder. Mm -hmm. You know, you start with a data pool, you observe what you observe, and you see and have experiences, and you take that data, you know, up your ladder. You right. know, you review it, you evaluate it, you give it meaning, you make assumptions, you draw your own conclusions, you put it against your own belief system, and you take action. That's the ladder. You know, if you can slow down your thinking as you go up that ladder, it's amazing how you can improve the quality of your thinking, the quality of your actions the quality of your decisions. One uh, situation that I think we've all been in, we've all been on the freeway and it's under construction and they consolidate it to one lane. Now, my mental model or my belief system says that we should one by one, each every other car, we do the zipper move. One car, then another car, then another car, we all take turns. But other people have a different mental model or schema that no, it's whoever gets to the end of the closed lane first is then able to <laughs> to scooch their way over in, in, in front of the other cars. Yeah. And I see this this conflict over, okay, well, who's right in that? And, and why is my mental model better? Why should we all take turns alternating every other car as we compress into one lane versus the, the people that rush to, rush to the front? Have you been in that situation before, John? I saw it on uh, Highway 7 this morning coming to work and probably every other day. And which uh, school of thought do you subscribe to? Rushing to the front and getting over? Because you will get to work quicker, probably, if the people are nice enough to let you in when you get up there. But those with my beliefs are probably going to do everything we can in our power to prevent you from coming over because you didn't follow the rules in accordance with my beliefs about the world. <laughs> well, the thought of uh, challenging our beliefs, the thought of, critical thinking why is it important in the army why do they care oh my gosh i look at like some of the things that they try to do in the basic course here at army management staff colleges the focus is around just recognizing a person's biases towards a topic and identifying how a person's bias creates their perspective and how using critical thinking to arrive at a fair-minded perspective is to our advantage but you know for the military we need people who are going to question what they saw, what they heard, what they read, and what they experienced. I mean, critical thinking requires self-discipline to use reason to avoid impulsive conclusions. I think that's part of the reason why we now see it in that ATP 2-33 intelligence analysis for information on critical thinking process. You know, we want people to know how to think, not what to think. There's just a mental dimension that is overlooked when it's, I don't care if it's decision making, problem solving, team building, critical thinking is a great method right. to get where we need to be. And I see it as probably being even more relevant today than uh, throughout history in the Army. As we look at the new operating concept, winning in a complex world, if we can get uh, everybody's brain working the thing of what we can, we can accomplish versus those that are passively waiting to be told what to do or or limited by their own experiences or perspectives. I think General Milley would agree with you. You know, when our new chief of staff of the Army, General Milley, gave a statement on 4 May, you know, he was leading and setting the example. Some of the things he said, like we micromanage and overspecify everything a subordinate has to do, which is not an effective way to fight. And we're going to lose a war if we approach things that way. You know, subordinates, General Milley tells us subordinates must have the freedom to disobey in order to achieve a higher purpose. Discipline, disobedience carried out with trust, integrity, and within the bound of ethical norms 
is let's, what we want. Let's talk about that one for a minute, because I think that caught a lot of people by surprise. To have the chief of staff of the Army state that subordinates must have the freedom to disobey an order to achieve a higher purpose certainly doesn't mean go out and disobey an order. <laughs> you know, I laugh when I read that because I try to put myself in the shoes of every staff sergeant or sergeant first class or officer in the Army who would say, oh, my gosh, what have you done? You know, what is this? But if you read it and you put it in the context, this man, he's trying to tell us we got to change the Army culture. You know, we got to talk about it, educate it, incentivize it, train it, and live it. If we're going to over-supervise, it might work in peace, but it's not going to work in conflict. We have to give people the tools to move forward with intent. That's what we do in Mission Command. Here's my intent. Now, go forth. Make sure what you do is legal, moral, ethical, not against Army regulations, but doggone it, don't sit around and wait for me to tell you what to do. Right. Get out there. Take initiative. I didn't tell you how to do it. I told you my intent. Mm -hmm. Now, go forth. Be a critical thinker. And do, because you are the person who's at the tip of the spear. You see situation better than I can because I'm not there. You have situational awareness, gain your situational understanding, and do the right thing. Think. Think critically. Let's qualify exactly what General Milley, the Chief of Staff of the Army, his intent was in discussing disciplined disobedience. From his words directly, under the realm of Mission Command, he stated, we're in the military, so you're supposed to say, obey your orders. It's kind of fundamental to being in the military. We want to keep doing that. But a subordinate needs to understand that they have the freedom and they are empowered to disobey a specific order, a specific task, in order to accomplish the purpose. It takes a lot of judgment. Such disobedience cannot be willy-nilly. Rather, it must be disciplined disobedience to achieve a higher purpose. If you do that, then you are the guy to get the pat on the back. General Milley said that when orders are given, the purpose of those orders must also be provided so that officers know both what they are to accomplish and how they are expected to accomplish it. To illustrate his point, General Milley offered an example of an officer who's been ordered to seize Hill 101 as part of a larger battle plan. I've said the purpose is to destroy the enemy. And the young officer sees Hill 101 and the enemy is over on Hill 102. What does he do? Does he do what I told him to do, seize Hill 101, or does he achieve the purpose, destroy the enemy on Hill 102? The answer, General Milley said, is that the officer is to disobey the order to seize the first hill because following that order would not achieve his commander's purpose. Instead, he takes the other hill, and he shouldn't have to call back and say, hey boss, can I go over to Hill 102? He shouldn't have to do that. General Milley said they should be empowered and feel they have the freedom of maneuver to achieve the purpose. In the next episode, John Kotzman and I continue the discussion on critical thinking. That I'm a prisoner of my own experience. Where do I start to make sense of the world? Well, I have to draw from my own education, from my own experiences, from what I've read, and from what I've witnessed and what I've experienced. That's, that's it. I'm a prisoner of that. That's next time on the AMSC Podcast. And we welcome your feedback. Please write us at usarmy.lovenworth.tradoc.mbx.amsc-podcast at mail.mail, or you can just write us at amscpodcast at gmail.com.